it's really too easy to say it's another faraway problem or just another internal conflict somewhere in Africa. What if I told you that us buying a new battery creates millions of displaced people and brutal preschool slavery? Thank you very much for having me. It's a very honor to have this kind of conversations. Um, I think uh, we, we need this kind of conversations because when we discuss this kind of topics, sometimes we reach a lot of people and we'll be able to explain some things that we weren't able to explain in, in other ways of talking. Congo um, has a very big, has many problems. It's not just one problem. It's not just related to cobalt and coltan. It's not just related to uh, Western countries because they play a very big role to that. It's not just because of Rwanda or Uganda. Those are neighboring countries who also enter Congo every time they need something from it because of their, um, of our natural resources. Ciao, this is True Stories Italy News. We report on international true stories, and this is a new episode. So Congo is a, is a one of the biggest countries in the world. Uh, it is, it's the second biggest country in Africa. And uh, this country has over 100 million uh, citizens. Um, so, but that, the complication of it is that it also has a lot of ethnic groups and when a country has those many ethnic groups sometimes they, they they have a lot of things that, that that join them but they also have a lot of things to fight for uh, between themselves especially land and all that and i think that's where many of the problems start in even though there are other countries that are playing a very big role in that. I think that's where they start. They always start by dividing us first and uh, telling this tribe, hey, this other tribe is taking your land. And then it always starts from there. Congo has many enemies because all those enemies, they need something from the, the country for their natural resources. We have many armed groups and some of them are not even from Congo. Like the... Um, uh, there is an armed group from Rwanda which is causing a very big problem in the eastern of DRC. Uh, this armed group uh, fled from Rwanda in 1994. If you're part of it, there was a, a genocide against Tutsi in Rwanda. And the genocide was done by people who were leading the country back then. They were from another tribe called Hutu. So when when they decided to kill the other group to see, they killed many of them actually. But uh, they they later joined the forces together and they were able to overtake to overtake the country. After taking back the country, the, 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 those people who were committing all those atrocities, they fled to DRC because it's a very big country. It has a lot of people, it has a lot of tribes, and it also has a lot of jungles. Hiding for them was very easy. So they all fled in Congo. After flee fleeing their country to Congo, then they had to leave. They had to also have power in the country. That's how they started raping women. They started um, uh, like taking things things from regular citizens they started um fighting so hard so they can control the mining areas so that they need to to also have money you know what if you know what i mean yes. so since that time that was this group has been one of the biggest problems Congo has ever had, especially the eastern of the earth. The, the, the other part took over the country, which was led, which was led by Paul Kagame, who is the president of Rwanda right now. So the, these people had to flee okay. and they entered the Congo as refugees. Sometimes they work with the government of Congo, which is weird. 
Um, like right now, they're working with the government of Congo because Congo is fighting, is saying that it's fighting Rwanda, right? The M23, if you've read about it, um, they're saying that it's from Rwanda. And for the government of Congo, is trying to find all the help that they can get to be able to find this rebel group. So since they already have this other rebel group that's that's been in Congo since 1994, they they, they already know that they hate the Rwandan government because that's that that they had that problem in in the past. So they uh they they created this ally so they can fight together the M23. Okay, so it's uh some kind of political problems that sometimes it's very hard to understand. But yes, sometimes the government of Congo works with this rebel group to fight uh, Rwanda when it enters the country. Um, and that also gives them, and that also keep giving them the power that they already did they have before. Uh, every time the government gives them the privilege of working with them, they also provide them with the uh, um, whether they, they, they supply them with equipment that they need to fight the war. They also give them access to some areas they, they, they shouldn't because they're not citizens of Congo. And they, even themselves, they know for sure that they're not citizens. They don't say that we're citizens. They always say that we're Rwandese and one day we'll go back in Rwanda to wage war against the current government and take back the country. So um, in Congo, it's just... We, we have so many problems, yeah. One of the most beautiful countries in the world, one of the richest countries in natural resources. Uh, it's called Congo because of this incredible river and it has to do also with an enormous rainforest. People yeah. talk about the rainforest and think of Latin America, but um, in Central Africa there is another equatorial rainforest, which is very important. So we read that people maybe if, if they make a little bit of money, they, they make one dollar a day. And uh, this, is, this is not acceptable. And we've been really helping people with um, a lot of stuff, whether it's uh, by providing them emergency relief, uh, long-term goals, like paying uh, school fees for some of the refugees, and also a, a lot of other uh, help like advocacy which i am actually i, I i'm i'm more passionate of advocating for refugees than everything else um the reason i'm saying this is because refugees are the refugees are the one of the most vulnerable people because they flee their country and they go to live in other countries where um, they feel that they don't have full right of, of doing anything and when they get to that country and most countries don't really treat refugees like other human beings uh, so they have to treat them and give them whatever they want. And um, a lot of problems I had when I was living in refugee camps was that, see, spending a night without eating is something that's very bad. But the next day when we find something to eat, sometimes you don't remember that there is a night last week or two weeks ago that you didn't eat. That's how we, we are made. But when there is an injustice where you are grabbed and beaten for no reason, where you are grabbed and put in prison for something you didn't do, that's something that's, that, 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 that kind of um, injustice stays in your mind until you die. It's something that traumatizes you more than I can really describe. And I've seen that happen many times to my relatives, to myself and many other. So the organization was made for that so we can be able to provide emergency relief. We can be able to help refugees with, with uh, their long-term goals, uh, whether it's to pay for uh, education, whether it's to build uh, shelters, and whether it's to do those long-term stuff and also advocacy so we can speak for refugees where they're not able to speak so we can get to some offices that refugees are not privileged like to arrive there and speak up their minds and say what they think people have has asked me about this question a lot is that we're not doing this for Congolese this organization is helping refugees around the world um I am Congolese. I know more about Congo and I know the struggle of being a refugee because I've been one. Uh, but uh, I also understand that whatever refugees are going through in Congo, 
is the same problem refugees are going through in Yemen, in Afghanistan, in Sudan. That's why this organization was made to be able to reach all refugees worldwide. Uh, so when people are displaced every day, uh, their houses are being burned every day. There are people who are being buried alive. So we, we see those kind of stories every day. But uh, it's very, um, sometimes I, I, I even feel very hard speaking about it. In Congo, we have three groups. We have the first group is the majority because it's like 95% of people. They're called, they're called Bantu. If you search on Google, you'll be able to understand they're called Bantu. And the second uh, group is uh, the nomads or um, what you call indigenous here, people who, who arrived in a country before everybody else. Um, they're nomads or pygmy because we speak French over there. And also the other group which I'm from is called Nilotics or Tutsi, depends with where you, you, you live. So wars in Congo always start from that third group, my third group. The reason is that other Congolese don't feel like we're Congolese enough. So, and we've been in the country, it's been over 400 years. We became Congolese before Congo has even been Congo. I've said that many times in my videos. So, um, Africa has a very different history than other continents because Africa was divided. I mean, Africa was divided that, that uh, somebody took me like a pencil and said, these are the states. Yes, that's exactly what happened. So the reason it was divided is exactly like you said. Somebody took a pencil, they sat down and they divided the continent. Um, they didn't divide it for for because uh, Africa was one country before, some kind of one country, but it was led by a lot of kings and. Uh, uh, emperors because they would fight a lot also i'm not gonna lie about that to, to for land but that that's usual for uh kings and all that the reason they, they that they divided it it was most it was mostly because of colonialism so during colonial during uh colonization they would fight each other i mean the european countries they they started fighting each other for land so the colonizer of uh, Congo, Rwanda, Burundi was Belgium. So they would start fighting each other for those countries. So that's when they sat down. They said, okay, instead of keeping fighting each other because of these lands, what if we divide, we divide the whole continent so everybody knows his part so we don't keep fighting each other? So Africa was not divided because for the African people's sake. It was divided for them to be able to be able to manage it. So after the Africa was divided, that's where I was trying to get, we were already in the in Congo, in what's called Congo today as to see of Congo, we were already in Congo and we weren't there just for a few years. We've been there 400 of years before that. So this started during colonization when they started distributing lands to other tribes. During that time, they didn't give us land. And that, that's where all the problems started. So other Congolese people, they don't think that we're Congolese enough. So they, they either they combine their forces and they say that they have to kill all of us or they have to kick us out of the country. So because our language is somehow similar to the language of Rwanda and they always try to connect us to, to Rwanda. And Rwanda lacks that because of their political reasons. For them to be able to keep entering Congo like that, they enter in our names, saying that they're us and then they do whatever they want because 
the international law does not allow one country to enter another country without any permission, right? So one, when they mask people that they're asked, they do whatever they want in the country. That's exactly what's happening right now during, um, with this new rebel group called M M23. So that's where the problems always started in Congo. That's how the problem in 1996 started. So the, the, the other tribes in Congo joined forces together and they said, we need to kick these people out or kill all of them. So um, Rwanda had already had a very big genocide. They didn't have any resources. They don't. They didn't have any money to rebuild the country. Banks were robbed and everything. The country was some kind of empty because people who didn't die fled the country. So they said, how do we enter Congo? Because we need natural resources to be able to rebuild the country. So because they learned that we were already undergoing a genocide, I mean, as to see of Congo, because other tribes were killing us that time, they said, okay, let's enter Congo in this name, in, in their names. We'll, we'll say that we come to save them, which means we won't have any problem with it. And Congolese will think that it's us, okay? So they did that. That's how they entered Congo. After entering Congo, that's when they also worked with the President who, uh, so in 1997, that's when a new president took over. That president was called uh, Laurent Desiree Kabira. It was um, another president. So they worked with Rwanda to be able to take back the country. And they did, that's when the war of 1996 started, that we always say. That's when all the wars started. So um, it always starts with that. During in in two thousand four, so after taking back the country, the country had was some kind of safe. People uh, went back to their usual uh, stuff, and everything was safe. And then in two thousand and four, it started again. They say that they want to kick uh, Tutsi out of the country. They were again. That's when the war of two thousand four started. Rwanda again entered the country. And that's how the war in 2012 started. And that's how we have the current war right now that started in 2017. So it's always, it always starts with the tribalism and then it goes back to everything else. Yes, I know there are many people playing on that. They pay some armed group from other tri tribes and then they pay them to start the wars. Yes, it's not just the, tri the tribes. It, it, it involves a lot of people. Other countries could be like witnesses to make sure that things yeah. would not keep going on. I think the, the, the people who were supposed to be doing that are the African countries, okay. but they're not able to do that. The reason I'm saying that is because some of them, like Rwanda, are benefiting from it, which means they can't be the one doing it. And the other people who are able to do that are way underdeveloped. And when a country is underdeveloped and they know for sure who is behind everything that's happening in Congo, they're afraid to even mention it. But they know problems will come to them if they do that. The problem is not just Rwanda, it's the, these other big countries like US, Canada, uh, China, because China also has a lot of uh, companies uh, doing mining in, in DRC. So it, it's not just uh, Africa, yes, who is supposed to do that? If these big companies, sorry, if these big countries are not doing it, I don't think it's, it's possible for these small countries to do it because they're afraid from this big company, uh, sorry, for this uh, big country. So what what Rwanda does is that it takes minerals from Congo, right? It takes them to Rwanda. They, processes, they, they process them and they send them to the Western countries. Rwanda does not or to kind of um, finish the products in Rwanda. They don't have that. They don't even, I don't think they even have any industry that makes any electronics. So what they do is just like a transport. They take the minerals in DRC and then they put them in Rwanda. Then they send them back to other countries where they're going. So it, the problem of Congo is very complicated. And uh, I think that that's actually one of the reasons we were not able to learn about it. I mean, you guys, you were not able to know about it because it's being done by these countries.
How can you tell me that we've lost close to 10 million people since 1994? And the war has been going on nonstop, but people are starting to learn about it right now. How can oh. anybody really explain that? Every time they speak about Africa, it's some kind of a summary. They don't really go deeper and try to understand what what's the cause of it. But again, I totally, I also understand about it. Because they the one causing it. How can you deeper, sorry, how can you go deeper if you know you're going to be the one who's going to, to who's the one causing it? You can't really go that deep. So, but it's really... Yeah. It's really not fair that we're losing that many people and I don't ex expect a everyone to care about some stuff like this. But I know for sure we'll always have people who don't care. Even if we, 100 million people that there will always be people who won't care. But at least try to ex to put our information there and see if we will find someone who can help. Because it's been... Um, it's been it's, it's it's too much like going through this over 20 years and seeing your country seeing your uh family members uh all spread around africa because they can live in their country so like all my uncles were refugees the only uncle from my mother's side who stayed in the country um also just left like two years ago uh, during this war, he also left because his village was also fully burned. We had a grandmother who couldn't walk anymore, which means uh, in the villages that they lived, they couldn't uh, take a taxi or they couldn't uh, do anything like that. Because even if they were able to walk many kilometers to get where they're going, they couldn't because on the way, they were, the, the way is blocked by many armed groups because th they control areas. Like these areas from here to there is uh, controlled by Mai Mai or another armed group. So they can't even walk, even though they're able to do that. So what we did is that people who are here, we had to find money to pay for for a, a helicopter to go and take them from the village and then take them to refuge. So uh, people, my family was able to escape that way because I'm here. I'm able to do something about it. I'm able, even though it's very expensive, I'm able to pay that money to be able to save them. Imagine other people who don't have that access. People are dying the worst death that you can really imagine. And the fact that people don't even know is uh, it's, it's very sad. The village where I grew up with is no longer there. Right now it's just jungle because they burned it down. Nobody lives there anymore. Everyone has fled. Okay. And that's the story for thousands of villages back home. See, the country is now like almost empty. Imagine that in Congo since the war started in 2017, millions of people have fled. Okay. And when millions of people fled, they flee the country. That means the country is going to stay the village the journalism used to be this kind of stuff where we all rely for information and it gives every information as it is they have to go even on the um at the place where there's wars and they be able to record testimonies from people they have interviews for people to be able to understand it but right now they just say it like a summary okay in congo there is a war going on between this group and this group and then they end there we don't know how the war started we don't know who started it we don't know what kind of solution we need to find to, uh, to end it they just say it like that but uh, there, there are other many people out there who care and who are doing everything they can to raise our voices. And so when every time somebody reaches out, I really don't take much to uh, to accept because I know for sure they're doing their part. Be also able to just uh, print out some uh, um, posters and then put them on the street. Maybe another person is able to raise awareness in the music. Maybe another person is able to raise awareness in the art or those kind of stuff. Yeah, we're all different and we are all talented and able to do things differently. It doesn't take us for to be able to do the same thing, do record, record videos or be journalists or have podcasts. Yes, we need all of that, but as long as we know that there's, there's another person who is doing something somewhere there, 
for this cause, I really, on my part, I really, really appreciate it. And then the other thing, yeah, and the other thing that I, I mentioned is that Congo is is was supposed to be one of the richest country in the world, but it's the poorest country in the world. Um, there is one soldier who they they asked that same question, and it was during an interview, and then he said that um sometimes it feels uh, he said sometimes it feels like being a Congolese is a curse, because how can we suffer this much for something that we don't even know? And that was a person who works in the government who said that. Because we've never been at peace. During colonialism, I don't know if you've read about it, we've had the worst colonialism of all. And after colonialism, the, the, a dictator took over called Mobutu. The country was also a little bit safe, but it wasn't safe either. People weren't allowed to talk or do anything. After him, there was that, that's when the 1996 war started. Since then, we've never been free. So being a Congolese sometimes really feels like a curse. And I work with other people. It's not like an organization that I own myself. Um, there are other people that I work with, but it takes a lot of time than other businesses because emotionally and all that. Yeah. Someone like me who already went through this and also be able to relieve that memories is something that no one can really understand unless uh, maybe, I don't know. Uh, it's very, very hard because people who've been through this and at some point they be able to escape it and they now live in a life where they can just try to do everything they can to forget about it because that's what they do many people people who have been in a, many traumatic situations when they escape it they do everything they can so they forget that and i really understand it uh, okay but for me i'm relieving that memories on top of that i'm going deeper because i have to now see videos worse than what I've already seen in the past. So I have to see them and then think about them because before making a video, you have to think about what you're going to say and then make a video about it, which means we're not just remembering what happened. We're even seeing more than what we saw in the past. So doing this, what we're doing is very, very hard, like very hard. Uh, it's uh, that kind of stuff that makes you lose sleep at night. And uh, But because we know for sure that if we don't do it, nobody else will do it. We have to do it because otherwise people will keep dying. We'll keep having phone calls that there are millions of people who are thousands of people who are dying. There are villages that are being burned and we can't really let that keep happening just because we need to preserve ourselves from traumatic situations. This was another episode of True Stories. Please like and subscribe for more.